Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Shannon and I'm going to speak today about my PhD research that I've been doing at the University of Western Australia. And what you're looking at right now are called murmurations. They're starlings and this is a flock. But in collective motion, these are also flocks. Um, this is a flock of E. coli that's not moving and this is a flock of people. And given that we see similar sorts of behavior in something as simple as a bacteria as we do in ourselves, and we like to think of us as being somehow superior to E. coli, we'd like to explain this. Um, so the thing is, is it's not uh, the complexity of the entity that's creating this uh, macroscopic phenomena. It's the complexity of the interactions. And Vicek was the first um, to look at modeling these as self-propelled particles. And he and his team kind of spurred an entire industry of trying to find new regimes of behavior and understand the um, uh, changes in these behavior depending on certain parameters. So he uncovered similar behavior following, um, when his particles followed a really simple rule. So all these particles were meant to do is uh, align with their neighbors. So they adopt the average directional heading of everyone around them within some radius. And that was enough to produce dynamics like this. Uh, Cousin um, comes from a more biological background. So they took this model and they added some attraction and some repulsion and a blind zone to make it a little more realistic. Uh, both of these models uncovered stable regimes of behavior, vortexing and uh, polarization. And as first order Langevin equations, once these um, states have been reached, they persist. So they don't help me in explaining, Ooh. yeah, it might take a while to, okay. They don't help me in explaining this sort of behavior. This is a bait ball. These are mackerel and they're being attacked by uh, tuna from below and uh, seagulls from above. And these are reindeer below being herded by people and this is budgerigars and there's falcons in the background there. And these predators are driving the dynamics. It's the self-preservation that uh, is really defining how these particles move. And so this makes us think that um, yeah, self-preservation is, is more what's going on here than cooperation. And in light of similar observations, aye. Okay, that. All right, so in light of similar observations, Hamilton proposed the notion of a selfish herd. And to illustrate this idea, he uh, used a one-dimensional toy model of frogs sitting on a lily pond's edge and there was a snake in the middle of the pond and the snake would emerge randomly and end the life of whoever was nearest. So these frogs would uh, start jumping around and trying to improve their odds of survival by reducing the area that is inherently theirs. Uh, the two-dimensional analog of this is the Voronoi space that was explained by our first speaker, so I won't go into too much detail. I'll just say that, um, so this, shaded region is the area in which if the snake were to pop up here, this guy would die. Um, around the edge, these particles on the convex hull here have an infinite area. And that's not great computationally for us and it's also not particularly biologically uh, reasonable. So we're gonna bound each particle by some sort of, you can think of it as a vision radius of the prey or um, an attack radius of the predator. And Voronoi spaces pop up everywhere in nature where things are competing for space or growing from some sort of seed. Okay, so following on from Hamilton, uh, people have uh, proposed a variety of different selfish movements and mechanisms for their, their self-propelled particles to move. Um, in general, we require three things of our selfish model we would like them to be biologically plausible. We would like them to be statistically beneficial to anyone that follows the rule. And we'd like for them to result in a compact aggregation. So a lot of what Hamilton's work was trying to show was a reason for 
people being, or species being gregarious in the first place? Why would things bother to live with each other when you're depleting resources? You're, so they're trying to explain why these gregarious species evolved in the first place. Um, here are just a couple of these. So uh, really simple single nearest neighbor and K nearest neighbor in general. So particle moving towards, just simply moving towards the average of then K neighbors. Uh, that uses a topological network of interactions. The Vicsec and the Kuzin model that I mentioned previously both use metric zonal um, neighborhoods of interaction. The Hamiltonian model uh, asks that the particles instead move into the space created by their nearest neighbor and their neighbor's nearest neighbor. So it's those frogs that are jumping into the space. And the local crowded horizon maps all particles onto a circle uh, centered at the individual of interest. And the size that those particles occupy on the circle is a function of their distance to that individual. And they move towards the densest region. Um, so both of these two use a visibility network where uh, some particles are just occluded from vision, but otherwise all are visible. I'm going to use a Voronoi jewel for my interaction network. It's the Delaunay triangulation or the mesh that was mentioned previously. Um, to me and to, to us, it makes sense that if the Voronoi uh, space and the Vor Voronoi polygon is what you're defining as your domain of danger and it's the thing that you're interested in, then it also defines what you care about in terms of uh, who you interact with. The problem with these models is none of them explicitly look to minimize that space. So moving towards your sim single nearest neighbor does not necessarily reduce that domain of danger. Um, in fact, it can make it a lot worse. So we want to improve on that. Our movement rule uh, takes the current Voronoi polygon and samples around the particle recalculates the hypothetical area that you would have should you move in that direction. And then we build a landscape with these hypothetical areas. It's a potential, and so just as a ball would roll in the steepest direction down a hill, our particles are gonna experience a force in the direction that best improves their domain. So two qualitatively different particles here. Uh, one on the periphery, so it's got uh, an infinite, but we've bounded it, still it's got a very large area. Um, and it's got a really simple goal, so it's got a really simple landscape. It's sloped and it would like to move inside that flock. This guy has a more complex landscape. He's sitting pretty with a really small domain, and he'd like to maintain that. He certainly doesn't want to make it worse. So he's got a really high potential in areas where he's going to open that triangle up and expose himself uh, in this direction, in this direction. So what this is, is it's an, in, an intuitive understanding of space, which I think is a biologically reasonable assumption that we have an understanding of the space that belongs to us. We know when we're invading someone else's personal space. It's also an understanding of the consequences of motion. So I know what will happen if I move here. I understand that I'm reducing or improving my space. Okay. So we take this force and we incorporate it into a really simple Newtonian update um, mechanism with an Euler-Mariyama uh, integrator. We also have some dissipation and some stochasticity. Um, okay. So, let's see how we go. These are the typical uh, metrics that are used to assess selfish networks um, and the behavior of selfish models. Uh, essentially, we would like two things. We want the majority of our flock to benefit, and we would like those that do benefit to benefit well. Certainly, more than random motion, and preferably more than everyone else's model. So, uh, in the first metric, we do. Uh, more of our flock benefits from following this rule. Our PDF has shifted to the right, good. The relative predation risk, which is essentially a measure of how much an individual stands to gain, is also improved. So, um, if you can't see, this 
best case scenario of previous models was about 37, uh, and ours is almost double that. So uh, we're doing good in there. We've got uh, biologically plausible and we've got statistically beneficial for the flock. Okay. All right, so let's see how this goes. Loading. Okay, so this is a simulation that I've run. I've initialized my particles randomly in a space. This uh, circle, gray circle that you can see here is um, just an indicative vision range for one particular particle. And what we see in the simulation, you might have to believe me on that, but we'll see if it loads, is definite aggregation. We see it in the danger domain of each individual reducing. Uh, we see nearest neighbours, here we go, thank you. <laughs> um, and nearest neighbours are reducing. We can also look at global measures such as the area of the convex flock. It's shrinking. So this is a before and an after, and we've aggregated up here. This is just a zoom in of this. And these two do eventually come together. Um, so that's good. I've got a good selfish herd model. Yay. What I now want to look at is um, once they've aggregated, once we've got that reason for being gregarious in the first place, what's going on now? So continued being selfish once you've kind of exhausted those benefits. It wants to finish. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do now is zoom in on this motion and we're going to look at what it looks like in here, this bit that you've just been watching. Okay. So, we look like a swarm, swarm of midges, shoal of fish, not much order. Uh, correlation, certainly, but not much order. Um, this is polarization, an order parameter in red, rotational order parameter, dilational order parameter, and this is comparison to data. It's qualitatively similar. We look like a swarm of midges. Okay. But I wanted a flock. I really wanted order. I wanted an excuse to look at those YouTube videos all day. So the problem with these is that they're not particularly bright they will allow their momentum to move them from a good position into a really bad position and they'll keep going. Um, and I'd like for them to be a little smarter than that, have a little more foresight and understand the future a little bit better. So we're gonna do everything we've done, we're gonna do it again. Hey. Okay, so we're gonna take a higher order model where now instead of just positions, we have an understanding of the velocity of our neighbours as well. And we can track the, our neighbours forward and understand how our Voronoi network evolves and how the force that we're going to experience changes as we look further and further in time. So for this particle that's on the boundary, he has still his really simple uh, sloped landscape to begin with, move inside that flock. It becomes really steep gradient when there's a great deal to gain and he actually has that opportunity in the next time step to get inside the flock. And then this landscape starts shifting and transforming. It, it wants to keep him, it's saying, don't go too far. Start turning now and fight for good position within the flock. Uh, and we weight these forces so that uh, current things are more important um, and the future's not as important but still present. Uh, we also include some repulsion, uh, as Cousin did, for the biological plausibility. And this, sorry, is uh, my flock. It's, it's ordered. There's local order. Um, there's rotation. So we can see improvements in polarization and in the rotation. This is counter and um, clockwise motion. Definite aggregation, definite benefits statistically by following this rule, but now we get order. Um, yeah. 
So finally, uh, we can look at how that forward um, foresight changes the polarization and the rotational order. Uh, this is how far we look into the future on the x-axis there. And as we look further, we see a definite transition into a higher ordered state. We've moved from a swarm or a shoal into a school, into something that's a bit more biologically plausible and is a bit sim more similar to something that we'd see in nature. Um, so increases in both rotation and polarization. Uh, so I guess viewing, viewing the ability to foresee future configurations as some sort of pseudo-intelligence, it makes sense that perhaps the small brains of Nidges are not capable uh, of this and so are restricted to just aggregating and swarming. And maybe flocks, slightly more intelligent birds, uh, can be a little more ordered and can flock. So hopefully I've convinced you of two things. That uh, if you're going to use a Voronoi network or a Voronoi as a metric for your danger domain, then you need to actively try and minimize that to get a good selfish model, or at least a better selfish model. And also that looking to the future can uh, transform a swarm into a flock. Thanks. Yes, 2D. So um, a swarm of midges certainly um, hovers in 3D, but the starlings tend to flock in sheep. So at the moment, that's my justification for 2D, um, but we're going to look to move it to 3D. Well, in your mathematical model, you have a gradient of a parameter you call capital A. The area, the sampled so area. Does that account for the excluded volume? birds fly, one of the things they don't want to do is to touch one another because they'll lose their lift. Mm -hmm. No. And then they'll fall to the ground. No, and these are point particles and there's all sort of catastrophes happening in the air with collisions and um, passing through each other. Yep. So at the moment, these are just particles. Mm. The, well, um, when I introduced the flock-like motion, I had a repulsion in that. So, um, but it, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't rigid, it was just a one on R potential for the repulsion. Yeah. How do you take into account the movement of the spider on I don't. I don't. Uh, yes, yes, I'm sure I could, but uh, to be honest, there's other things that I think I'll end up doing, like the extension to 3D. Uh, I'd also like to maybe look at some game theory and um, really look at the, the selfish component more so than the, the medium or, yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure it plays a, a big part in reality, especially for something like a mid <laughs> getting blown around, yeah. Uh, previous models, yes, mine's inertial. Yes, yeah, uh, my, mine is a force that, that they experience that changes their velocity in that way, yes. Yeah, but yes, pre previous models were purely dissipative and they would just update immediately. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, we build a potential based on uh, areas, hypothetical areas. Um, so, so, yes, yeah, and that's the minimum. So, and it's not always, it's not a global minimum, it's a local minimum. So, um, yeah, they, they'll continue to update in small time steps. Yeah. I'm afraid that we have to stop because I'm not a monkey. 